thank you so much for joining. Um, um, I'd love to tell you a little bit more about this book I've written um, <laughs> called Triple Helix um, and what family history means to me uh, as a donor conceived person as we celebrate Family History Month. Um, so as you heard, you know, I'm both an engineer and a writer. And so um, my life has been a story of, of letters and, and numbers, I suppose. So um, starting with the numbers, the book covers a 16 year period of my life, which was distilled over four years of writing and editing into down into the 269 pages um, of, the, of the final book. And um, just wanted to start, you know, why, why did I title it Triple Helix? Um, so the Triple Helix um, represents the three strands of my biological father, my social dad and my mother, but it also represents the DNA and the experience um, and the psychology that makes us all who we are. My donor conception journey um, wasn't straightforward. Um, and so the structure of the book I wrote quite deliberately reflects that in that it's not written chronologically and there are a lot of twisting metaphors like rivers and spirals that, that recur. And the helix is a symbol that uh, endlessly kind of revolves around back around itself, um, which seems fitting because um, the donor conception journey is never really over, but you know, at least the book is written. So that, <laughs> that's, a, that's a, um, a relief for me. Um, so the, the reason why I wrote um, Triple Helix was to answer a question that I was commonly asked, um, which was um, why, why did I need to find the truth of where I came from? Um, for me, you know, it was a little bit strange um, that people always ask me that because it always seemed really self-evident, um, you know, a human need that's quite both blindingly obvious, yet it's often um, a mystery or even incomprehensible to the public in the context of, uh, of donor conception, like why we need to know that information. So the um, book really explores this universal question of being, which is who am I? And it opens at a pivotal moment of my life. So if we rewind all the way back to the 3rd of January, 2005. So it was just a few days after my 21st birthday. Um, I didn't have a Facebook account, but I did have a MySpace. <laughs> so it was a very long time ago. Um, but that was the day that my mum sat me down and, and she explained that, that dad wasn't my biological father. And um, as my sense of identity um, kind of sh shattered in that moment. And I discovered I was conceived with anonymous donor sperm. Um, and my biological father was known um, only by this kind of impersonal moniker of C11, which was his donor code. And uh, I had no idea, it was su such a shock, um, which was really compounded by this devastating sense of powerlessness as I learned that the law um, locked me out of ever knowing where I came from. So I was really caught in a bind between needing to know and never being able to find out. And I felt completely disenfranchised by um, both the state, um, the doctors who treated my mother, and even my own parents um, who wielded power over me and um, all claimed to be acting in my best interest as they continued to protect this secret. Um, so I felt this really terrible kind of um, impotent, in a rage, all of the barriers that prevented me from accessing this deeply personal information. Um, but this was all kind of very much kept below the surface. Um, you know, after my mom told me when I was 21, life continued more or less as before. Um, and after, about three years later, um, after it was quite a sort of painful kind of silent time of you know, internal grieving, um, I experienced a second pivotal moment in my life. And that was meeting um, for the first time another donor conceived woman um, whose name was Narelle Gretsch. And now Narelle recruited me to a group called Tangled Webs, um, some of whom I've, I've got a sneak peek here. I'm actually on this webinar who were um, fighting this political battle to create world first laws that would enable all donor conceived people born in Victoria to access information about our biological parents. <clears throat> And it was really a classic David versus Goliath situation in that we faced this powerful and well-resourced medical industry with really nothing except for our personal stories. Um, and virtually nobody thought we stood a chance. Like people were very dismissive of, of, um, of our goal. 
So it was, um, yeah, it was late 2008 when I had my very first meeting with a senior member of the Victorian Parliament, sort of launched into this advocacy um, chapter of my life. Um, and to be honest, he really epitomised kind of a, a typical pale male and stale MP. Um, and I was really nervous, like I had kind of no idea, um, never done this before as I shared my story of genetic bewilderment, um, you know, all the unknown medical history and even things like fear of accidental incest with um, these half siblings that, that I don't know um, um, their identities. Um, and these were like really personal things I hadn't been able to talk about, even with my close friends. Um, so it was quite a moment for me and it was <laughs> kind of heartbreaking. MP just dismissed my plea for help in the search for my donor fa father. And he actually just said to me, what you don't know can't hurt you and how wrong he was. So, so why did I need to know? <clears throat> you know, um, despite this lack of information, um, I really felt the presence of my um, unknown biological father, you know, almost, um, almost physically like in, in the corner of my eye was just this unknowable figure. Um, but I could really sense his presence um, in my periphery and describe it as being like the, the greatest mystery of my being and almost like a splinter in my brain, you know, just something that was, um, um, it just made me really restless and um, kind of really unsettling feeling. And there were several levels um, to my desire to solve this mystery. So first of all, um, I was interested in knowing who had helped to create my physical self and contributed the DNA that had influenced all of my attributes. So things like looks and personality and interests. But also the next level of awareness was about seeing myself not just as an individual, but as a link in the chain of my ancestors. And I, I suppose I really longed for my cultural heritage and things like knowing the countries my ancestors came from and, and the languages that they spoke in um, as they told their stories. And so not knowing my biological father, it was like this uh, erasure of this ancestral memory or historical consciousness. Um, and I felt a loss of connection. Um, it, was, it was like I was um, a, a stray link that had fallen out of the chain of humanity. And it was um, kind of a very destabilizing vertigo. And I describe it um, in the book as being, as feeling like a tree without roots. Um, so for many don't conceive people, our family history really is this kind of seminal mystery, pardon the pun. Um, <laughs> but like many, um, donor conceived people and, and adoptees and, and many others. As part of my search for my family history, I, I turned to a relatively new but fast growing technology that seemed like a promising way to transcend my really limited information. Um, and that was consumer DNA testing. And so um, our DNA, you know, back to the letters and numbers, it's described by four letters, a G, C, A, and T. Um, and it was this pattern um, in, you know, in the double helix of my cells, every, every one of my cells, that was something that could never be altered um, you know, by the signing of a contract or the passing of a law or other mechanisms to kind of sever this, this linkage. Um, and so you know, um, I've got a science background. So scientifically, there's a measurable closeness in the genetic link. Um, the unit of measurement is, um, uh, it's, a, it's called a centimorgan. It's a little bit, um, um, arca arcane, but it's named after Thomas Morgan, who was an American geneticist who discovered the role that chromosomes play in heredity. In heredity. Uh, and so DNA doesn't lie, and its subjective truth, but truth was a compelling reason why my mom had decided to reveal the secret to me because she feared that one day I would find out anyway. Um, so she was quite prescient, you know, through things like personalised medical treatment or now, you know, people give ancestry kits as like Christmas presents to people and a lot of people are, um, you know, are getting involved. Um, and I, I had hoped that joining a DNA database might reveal a close relative, maybe even a half sibling um, or the donor himself. So I ordered the kits, um, you know, have you ever done one you kind of spit into this tube or scrape your cheek with a plastic scraper you know, box, boxed it up and returned um, to the laboratories in the United States you know and the reason why I did that you know I wasn't just seeking 
to unravel the mystery of my own DNA. Um, although any information about, you know, medical history that I was still missing or, um, you know, in, um, hereditary diseases would have been uh, very welcome. But the questions I had, which at the time I did that, um, uh, sort of the early, around 2010, I think, was um, at the time those questions remained a little bit half formed in my, even in my own head. Um, but they couldn't have been answered even if I had sequenced my entire genome because I was really searching for something a bit deeper that went beyond the facts, you know, of, of the of the code um, that was still missing from my consciousness. Um, but obviously family isn't just about genetics um, and unlike the standard Senti Morgans, um, you can't measure personal connection quite so quantitatively. Um, so kind of moving on to how do donor conceive people define our family connections and history? Um, so there's really no clear cut answer here. So some donor conceive people such as myself um, attach a significance to people that we share genes with, um, but we didn't grow up with. Um, and I always saw these people as my family, at least in some sense of the word. Um, but for others, lack of social connection or social bond means that the genetic connection does not constitute family as they understand it. Um, but to add extra complication, these judgments and responses are not clear cut and static, but they're often very nuanced and can change over time as well. Um, so I found like both in my own family and also um, in conversation with a lot of other don't conceive people that these shared or divergent worldviews concerning these frames and narratives of family actually really hugely impactful on the relationship between donor conceived people and their parents and their siblings. Um, because if you can imagine, you know, if, um, you know, if you think someone's in your family tree, but your sister or brother doesn't share that, then um, it, it can be quite sort of um, divisive or difficult to kind of navigate that. Um, so in my book, I talk a lot about strange loops. And if you're familiar at all with the um, Dutch graphic artist, MC Escher, um, these are self-referencing loops which create these um, ambiguous layers between different levels of reality that are sort of a hallmark of his, of his artwork. Um, and these images kind of help convey the, um, the uncertainty of being donor conceived, of trying to figure out some basic questions about ourselves, like, who is my family? Um, so without trying to get too metaphysical, I wanted to talk a little bit about um, sort of one of the core themes um, in Triple Helix is around seeking truth um, and um, about the difference between knowledge versus understanding. And so donor conception is often viewed through the lens of science. Um, it's often reported as like a medical technology that enables people to have children without much consideration of the potential human impacts. So in setting out to answer that question about why did I need to find my biological father, I had to take the reader um, on a journey in search of truths that lie beyond the boundary of kind of objective scientific knowledge. And I found that my biggest challenge as a writer was really how to transcend um, into the realm of subjective, subjective understanding, so emotion, and to try to convey the feelings brought about by my lived experience in the absence and the presence of these complex family relationships. Um, and I find it really interesting, you know, obviously I have an engineering background, sort of um, analytical um, thinker, but you know, you know, in our Western scientific culture, people often equate knowledge with the truth. Um, and it wasn't until 1931 that an um, Austrian mathematician called Kurt Gödel, um, he published a, um, a famous um, incompleteness theorem. Um, and this was really astonishing because it was a proof um, which actually identified the limitations of um, verifiable knowledge because um, he showed that there will always be some truths that lie beyond the boundary of what we can actually prove. Um, so this really shattered um, 
the deeply held beliefs that, that science and mathematics contain um, absolute truth. Um, so kind of interested to explore like what else is there? Um, like, you know, what are these truths? Um, <clears throat> and so, um, you know, there, there are sort of alternate viewpoints and I appreciate, um, I find that often um, there seems to be a lot of deep wisdom sort of contained within um, in Indigenous knowledge systems, like, for example, um, in Tyson Yanka Porter's book um, called Sand Talk, he talks about how things can't exist in isolation, um, you know, um, that, you know, the scientific method really operates with this fundamental assumption that the subject being studied will exist in complete isolation from the objective of researcher. But, um, but nothing really exists um, except in terms of relationships. Um, and, and the whole universe is really built on connection. So without connection, there is no meaning. Um, so to give a concrete, more concrete example of what I'm, um, you know, the difference between knowledge and understanding. Like when I first began my search for C11, my donor father, I was given some non-identifying information and this just comprised five facts, um, which described my biological father's physical appearance. So it was um, his, height, his height, his weight, his hair and eye color, and his race was ca uh, Caucasian. <clears throat> So here was an example of, of knowledge, which was really absence of the, in the context of understanding. Um, and in this case, a relationship with my biological father. So those five non-identifying facts, um, um, you know, they, in, in one self, on one level, they provided some knowledge about C11, but I really, you know, didn't understand um, him, but they neglected to describe his essence of things like what did he care about or what made him laugh. And so um, by focusing a lot on elevating the importance of lived experiences, my goal, um, you know, as Susan mentioned in, in the introduction, was really to spark this conversation about how to protect the best interests of the people created um, at this really potent intersection where we find ourselves, the all-consuming desire to have a child, um, the power of emerging biotechnologies and um, also the assisted reproductive industry, which is um, growing ever larger and more global and commercialized. Um, so this is an ongoing project um, working together with an organi organization called Donor Conceived Australia or DCA. Um, definitely worth checking out. I think we've got some um, a rep <laughs> from them. Uh, on the web webinar as well, who I'm sure can answer questions if anyone has any. Um, <clears throat> yeah, so, so, who, so, what did I discover? You know, like in that, in um, this this sort of universal question of who am I? Um, so, as I mentioned, I'm an engineer and a writer, and my life has been this kind of story of letters and numbers. Um, so, when I finished high school, um, I actually my best subject was um, was English and. But I also loved to fly planes. And um, at the time, I didn't know any writers or published authors. So I chose this path of aeronautical engineering, maybe because the people in my life, um, you know, my parents made their living from numbers. Um, so my love of, of writing really retreated to this just private kind of journaling and, and so on. <clears throat> and during my PhD, um, I was the um, face of an RMIT university marketing campaign. Um, so, <laughs> um, you know, uh, in, in the clip, I kind of, I say, my name is Lauren Burns and I am the author of my own story. It's a little bit ironic because in truth, I was far from in control of my destiny. Um, as I mentioned, the Lord had locked me out of ever knowing where I came from. So over the next 10 years, I kind of really launched into activism to change this. And of course, <clears throat> it was the letters and numbers that formed C11, my biological father's donor code, um, this was the only name I knew him by. And so I really um, began this phase where I became driven by this obsessive fever to crack this code. And so engineering um, really requires a systematic kind of analytical approach, which served me well in this struggle to learn the truth, um, working with many other donor conceived people and 
and donors and um, and our supporters. We battled you know, a lot coming from adoption community as well, and, and some um, some parents who don't conceive people. Um, we sort of battled this updated legislation, this medical cultural silence, and um, in this political campaign to pass world first laws to overturn decades of donor anonymity. And I found that um, you know, it was interesting that our legal and social and medical establishments, they really operate under this very rigid binary of fatherhood. <clears throat> so kind of implicit in that paradigm is this, this question um, that kind of haunts, I think a lot of donor conceived people, which is, you know, who is my real dad or, you know, or my real mom? And the need to, to choose, um, you know, who was the, the real parent never sat right with me. Um, I, th I thought it was a trap um, just leading into this minefield of, of loyalty and betrayal because I could never reject the dad who raised me, um, but I also couldn't deny the reality of my DNA. So um, I found that, you know, in life, we often can't see the frames around our views because they are invisible. And it took me 12 years to bring into focus the limitations of this rigid dichotomy and question this paradigm. Um, and so finally I realized that I could transcend the pressure to figure out who my like real father is by rejecting the premise of that demand um, that I had to choose um, and instead to embrace that in fact, both of the social and the biological stories of my paternity are true. And another paradigm I reject um, very strongly is also the market language, which um, is creeping into every facet of human existence, including the assisted reproductive industry and kind of powering this global trend towards industries um, influencing governments to regulate themselves for their own profit. But the creation of life, of human life is not a consumer product or a commodity. Um, and it's essential that this conversation, public conversation around policies and regulation really abandons the language of the market um, to enable us, the people conceived, to reclaim our, our humanity. Um, so thus, like Triple Helix also wanted to be a call to arms to fight back against the commodification of, of really what is most precious to us. Um, so um, sort of talking now about reunion and beyond. So I set myself the task of, of finding my donor father. Um, it was quite a, the de detective story of how I found him. Um, a lot of you probably already know the story, but no spoilers for those that don't. Uh, and it, it did feel like a, a jigsaw puzzle falling into place when I finally received the first letter from my biological father. Um, and I found that his family tree really mirrored my dual love of, of words and equations. Um, so his siblings included a maths teacher and also an English literature academic um, and a journalist. And then I've been so fortunate um, in being really warmly welcome um, in meeting and getting to know this family. I've discovered um, these kind of recognizable rhythms in our lives and you know, something really intensely satisfying in discovering all that and finally being able to make sense of a lot of things by seeing um, my looks and <clears throat> personality and interests mirrored in multiple generations of, of this. And like many in this family, um, I have a PhD and um, we all um, randomly drove Subaru Foresters. <laughs> I don't know if that's genetic, um, you know, love nature. Um, dropped crumbs down my shirt, excel at sports and all of those things. Um, so yeah, most, most people really, including myself, thought that if I could just, you know, find the identity of C11 and add together my social and biological families, then it would form this unified kind of whole identity. But I found, you know, in the 10 plus years since meeting him, it's really not as simple as that. Um, so of, of that day when we first met, I, I wrote in the book, the whole experience felt liminal and weird. It wasn't about anything anybody had or hadn't said that day. On the one hand, it seemed natural, like we had already met, but it also felt a little awkward. 
the resemblance was so strong and yet we were strangers connected in looks, personality and interests, but separated by a complete absence of shared memories. And so, um, you know, the facts are my relationship with him is not the same as he has with these other children. You know, we're saying that we share that same closeness in our genetic link, you know, however many sensing organs, but really the emotional dependency and the shared closeness of upbringing that created their social attachment was entirely absent for us you know didn't meet until I was 26 so we hadn't been those things to each other and um, I try and explain it in the book as you know time is the distance between us that that lost time and so on reflection you know even though I was extremely fortunate I really got the best result I could have ever hoped for in my search um, there's still a part of me that feels a bit cheated or a bit like swindled out of the opportunity to grow up already knowing all these facets of that I'm gradually discovering about myself as, as we kind of, um, you know, deepen the reunion. <clears throat> and so despite my success in cracking the code of C11's identity, um, I find this, there's still this kind of strange dissonance in my own psychology. It's a little bit hard to explain, but, you know, the best I can do is just ask you to imagine trying to dance simultaneously to two pieces of music that are, um, discordant with each other and so you overlay these rhythms and they can sort of briefly synchronize but it you know pulls away from from each other too and you know likewise there are these parts of myself that are different to the family I grew up with that I do catch glimpses of um, in this family I've discovered but um, still kind of feel myself orbiting a little bit like a satellite like always a little bit apart from their world and not not quite knowing how I fit in um, but yeah, but um, I, I suppose I found clarity in accepting that both my social and genetic family connections are real and are true, you know, each in their own way, um, yet somehow um, they just can't really be mapped onto each other. There's always a limitation where the two don't quite fit together. <clears throat> but sort of one like really positive development was um, recognizing or giving permission to recognize myself as a writer um, so as part of the discovery of my family history I learned um, my grandfather was a somewhat notorious historian and writer and indeed the whole family um, many of them had published you know everything from poetry to biography to political analysis um, so for years I'd really wanted to write a book to convey the complex issues that can arise for donor conceived people um, this perspective that's really for such a long time been unknown or ignored, but it wasn't until I discovered um, my connection to this literary family that I, that I finally felt the confidence that writing was something that I could do. Um, so, yeah, so I began the task um, and um, my writing method is very <laughs> opposite to my systematic engineering approach, so I really prefer to avoid structure and just try to connect to my subconscious through, um, you know, through dreams or, or meditation and then write quite intuitively in like a stream of consciousness and see kind of what comes from that. Um, yeah, but um, in saying that, um, you know, there were, there's kind of a feeling of flow in both my engineering and, and writing, um, you know, a difficult passage of the book could suddenly fall into place and it's like this ecstatic feeling when you finally collapse all your numbers and all your equations into like a single just very elegant graph and the satisfac satisfaction of of making obvious what was hidden um, you know as the saying goes writers often need a deadline so it was spring of 2020 when um, I was actually <clears throat> three months pregnant when I decided to stop um, this endless tinkering and sort of submit my manuscript to several publishers um, <laughs> I got like completely um, no response from anyone so I found that you really need to know people in the trade to get published. Um, so very fortunately, my sort of new literary family connections came to the rescue and um, got introduced to a very good literary agent. And with her backing, suddenly, um, you know, I did, did get some feedback. And so that was, you know, the midst of this global pandemic we've all just been through. And I was so lucky to um, ink the deal with um, a very supportive team at University of Queensland Press. Um, in February 2021, um, when I was seven months pregnant. And so, um, 
you know, in birthing my book and my human babies, um, the support of my partner, um, Jerry, and this small group of women um, uh, to play midwife to the creations was really critical. Um, and I uh, found, you know, <laughs> that the key was, uh, in both cases, was to remain calm <laughs> and positive through this process of transition, you know, from my comfort zone to discomfort to the pain zone and then beyond to this kind of transformational zone where I learned to just to let go and allow the strange workings of nature to take the lead. So to sum up, um, Triple Helix is the radical rewriting of my personal history and sense of identity after meeting my biological father and discovering I'm connected to this well-known Australian family. And it, I wrote it to personalise um, a, sh a shadowy system of donor conception that has been practiced for well over 70 years and created millions of people worldwide. Um, and so sort of uh, riffing off that, um, that, you know, RMIT campaign, my name is Lauren Burns and I'm happy to report that finally I am the author of my own donor conceived story. So thank you, that's, um, that's wrapped up from me. Um, I'll back to Susan, I suppose, thank you. <clears throat> Hello. Oh, thank you, Lauren. That was excellent. Thank you. Um, and I've read your book and it was wonderful. It's, it's great because it is, I've, I've actually got it for my, I don't know if you can see it. I've got it here. It's a, ah, oh, you can't see it. It's a very, it's actually a very slim volume, but it really packs a punch. You've got a lot in there. Um, and I'm an adopted person and I found myself nodding along vigorously. Um, and your description of trying to find your father I thought was really beautiful it was trying to find him was like trying to find silence it was everywhere and nowhere and I thought that was just beautiful um so yes and I've, I've bought it for my uh book club to try and get the message out there and uh, it's really get, be a really interesting book club title so I'll be interesting to see what they make of it um because I think it is very difficult for people who don't have that lived experience to wrap their head around how it must feel and thank, thank um, you Susan yeah it was, it's a great <coughs> book um and I've got a couple of questions for you I just wanted to start there was one part in your book that really struck me you were meeting with a politician who remains nameless and he ended your meeting by saying well you look normal um how, <laughs> how do you deal with something someone saying something so ridiculous oh yeah um yeah that uh, it, it's kind of, um, it's so frustrating because I felt like a lot of the time I, um, you know, I, you couldn't um, allow yourself the luxury of articulating your real feeling because you're really playing a game of, of power, I suppose, like a, a game of chess. So I just, <laughs> he's like, made this lame joke, like, oh, don't worry, at least you look normal. <laughs> so I just kind of bit my tongue on that one. But, um, but yeah, I hope things are changing with, um, you know, I think, um, it's really important we have um, more diverse representation in our different power structures, like um, uh, in politics and, um, you know, every walk of life, really. Um, and that, yeah, we can, I think, so that, that um, yeah, pe people, um, you know, you can be, you can see yourself represented there and, and have a, a bit of a better connection. And is there any, are there any other donor conceived people on the board of VATA now? No, um, unfortunately not at the present time, although I'm hoping that people will apply and, and be encouraged and that, that will change. Um, there is a, a recipient mother of a donor conceived child on the board, um, but no um, donor conceived people at this point of time, which I think is a real, um, is a real shame that, you know, um, there's so many um, very well qualified people that, that could really, um, uh, uh, yeah, I think it would add a lot, a lot to the board. And do you think uh, this is something that I find is that it seems that the lived experience of people is trumped by people with academic qualifications. So yeah. you can have nothing yeah. to do with it, but research it uh, and not really understand in great depth, but because you've got an academic qualification, your experience, you know, your, your work trumps the lived experience. Yeah, and that's really what I was talking about. With, I was trying to convey with that sort of knowledge versus understanding mm. piece, so that you know that who's who's um, uh, you know seen as the experts. Typically, it's the sort of the 
you know, the doctors and the psychologists and the researchers um, and, it, um, you know, the, the knowledge systems are not as highly valued for the lived experience. But I'm, I, I'm hoping that that, that um, people will recognise the limitations around that and realise that we do need to have that, that mix. And is that something, I mean, you try and amplify the voices of other donor conceived people. Is that the way forward or is it getting more people onto boards or in politics? Yeah, I mean, I, I think that, um, yeah, that, that getting more people on and the question I suppose is, is how do you, how do you do that? Um, mm. And I, I think that there is a tension, particularly in assisted reproductive industry you know it's it's um you know three years on the board of vata and it's a very small organization that's got this sort of immense task of regulating this um very large kind of um for-profit industry and um I, I think that you know that there there is a tension between um you know really kind of listening and acting on the perspective of donor conceived people and some of these kind of um you know that industry representatives that don't want to have to comply with, um, you know, with any limitations on, you know, on, on their own profit-making capacities. Yes. So I think that, that that was like a, a tension I faced a lot of, <clears throat> I did, um, yeah, kind of experience that. And um, so um, it, it's kind of even broader than that, this one specific example, but it's, you know, how do we um, make sure that, you know the industries are working in the public interest and but particularly you know this is one where um when we get it wrong it really impacts on like the fundamental um you know on people's lives so it's it's really you know, can't afford to make mistakes and you talk um in your book as well about the language that is used to and that that, that you can change the language to justify the direction that you want to go in yeah that the, the words are definitely um, weapons, I suppose, you know, it, it, um, and I think that part of that um, kind of uh, regaining control over the narrative is around, um, you know, choices of language and, and how that kind of the discourse and, and, and how it's represented. So just take like, you know, words like father and, and mother and, and donor and think about the different connotations of those words and, you know, some some are um, very distancing. Some are, um, you know, very kind of um, intimate. So um, yeah, it, it is. Um, I think that that there's work to be done, and this is you know obviously in the adoption community as well around like taking back ownership over the language and um, and kind of that um, you know allowing um, the people conceived to maybe to drive that. Mm. And uh, I had another question before I open up to everyone else. Sorry, I'm monopolising you here. Um, about language, now there's, there's talk about changing birth certificates to include um, multiple parents on there. Um, have you taken any steps to make your, put your donor on your birth certificate or to make your relationship sort of uh, official in that sense, in a documentary sense? Um, no, I haven't, but I know... Um some donor can see people who have. Um, so um, Damien over in South Australia, he um, looked into that and, you know, the um, Attorney General Department put on like multiple um, lawyers to kind of <laughs> block that. So, um, you know, it is, um, I, I think that it sort of comes back to that, that sort of um, binary paradigm we currently have around who is or isn't a parent and just trying to get, get past that blockage. You know, currently there's only space for two parents on birth certificates, which doesn't really, I think, adequately explain a lot of um, situations for, you know, adoptees or donor conceived people or mm. um, people born by surrogacy or other <clears throat> different variations. So, um, yeah, I think that, that um, truthful birth certificates are an important part of, um, part of law reform um, and that, you know, it can, yeah, it can, it can um, just take away the, the power uh, you know people have to keep secrets mm. you know it's kind of laid out as as you know as, as part of people's identity documents and certainly in terms of family history it would be better for family history researchers <laughs> yeah that's true had the accurate records yeah um I think I find like you know a lot of um you know most families have some sort of um 
um, different secrets if you go back far enough or even not that far. And um, yes, um, definitely would <laughs> make the job easier of um, people <laughs> researching their family tree, you know, far from now. And it like um, donor conception, like adoption, it is intergenerational. So it does um, impact and flow down through um, not just the um, the direct people conceived, but their their descendants and, and so on. And there, actually, there was a there was a question in the chat about the the impact this has had on you. Uh, how do you how do you feel that being donor conceived has impacted on your relationship with your daughter? Yeah, um, I, I I think that um, you know it, I'm I'm happy that um, that I've done the work that, so that she. Um, can grow up, you know, much more normalised in knowing um, all these people she's related to. So just like, for example, like when she was only six weeks old, we actually um, took, um, we drove up to um, like a family property on the south coast of New South Wales, which is owned by um, my biological donor parents family. And we, we just hung out there, you know, in a bit of a baby bubble. Um, and yeah, so she visited that when she was like literally six weeks old. Um, and I think and, it, you know, it's kind of, it's, it's a bit of, I think, a um, sort of healing opportunity. Um, you know, it's, yeah, it's just really nice to, um, you know, just to to feel like, you know, you can, or you can when you parent her and you can see, you know, that um, some trait that you can just tell is from me or my, or my partner, um, Jerry, and that, you know, just, um, yeah, just just um, hoping that, um, that that she won't, you know, feel that, yes. <laughs> that inner, inner rage about being, you know, denied all that information and that, you know, there's an opportunity to do better. And she'll just take it all for granted. Yeah, yeah. hopefully. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I'm just going to go to drop, jump to some other questions in the chat. Ah, sorry. Um, so a question actually that when I was putting this together, my colleagues asked me was, what is the best time to tell someone about their donor conceived status? Um, I think the best time is um, just right away. Like, um, and it's not just like a, a one time only, like oh, tell them like tick <laughs> kind of job <Yes>. done. Um, <laughs> so um, yeah, I think the, the advice is like, you know, um, just to always tell your child, even since they're a baby or, or a toddler and obviously like, you know, age appropriate language or um, there's some resources that um, VATA provide like storybooks and, and so on. But I, I think, yeah, just to um, to tell them early and again and again, and um, if possible, um, sort of, um, I think kids pick up on, you know, if there's tension or anxiety um, when the subject is raised, I think they'll instinctually be like, oh, that's a bit taboo. And Mm. They'll, they'll kind of shrink back from asking questions but so um you know it, it is hard stuff it's not always easy but if people can you know try to be open sort of in their um in their actions and emotions as well as their words then that that's really ideal I think and and as you were saying with uh DNA consumer DNA testing kits it's very hard to hide things now yeah yeah in um Victoria we now they now have an addendum on the birth certificate so it's like if you apply for a birth certificate after you're 18 um, in Victoria, you'll get like a slip saying there's more information available and direct you to the donor registers. But uh, I've heard anecdotally that some parents are still, um, you know, talking to the fertility councils and be like, oh, I'll just order 10 copies of their birth certificate and if they ever need one, I'll, I'll have one at them. home and they'll never have a need to go in and order one. So people are still kind of trying to justify these scenarios where they can keep a secret. But um, I think... Yeah, it's, I think that that's really obsolete now. The whole anonymity is dead through DNA testing and, and social media. So, you know, although I think there's like a strong moral argument for having laws that provide for open ID, um, you know, in a practical sense, it hardly matters because, you know, if people want to find their relatives that they, they can now through DNA testing. Mm. And what about um, medical history as well? Have you... Um, I, I know Narelle sadly passed away um, from an inherited disease from her donor father, or that came through her donor father. Um, so, and do you feel that uh, identity is kind of pathologized in some way? So it's it's okay if you're asking to identify the person because you want your medical history, but 
Um, if you want any more than that, if you want to have some sort of connection that there obviously must be something wrong with you or or you've had an unhappy upbringing or. Yeah, yeah, that, that's a really interesting point because um, I find like a, for a lot of um, people, they can sometimes, um, the, go, the go-to can be like the medical history, which it may be genuinely their primary driver, but I think it's also the most socially acceptable driver because everyone's like, oh, okay, yeah, I understand. You have to, I get that, you know, you have to provide history of heart disease or, or cancer or whatever, and that's important. And also I think through the um, medical fraternity, like a lot of the treating doctors, um, you know, that can be a way to approach it. So to kind of communicate with, with their value system as well. But um, yeah, it is, I feel like, it, yeah, it is, um, it, it's difficult because we, we um, often feel like we're on the back foot or we have to, you know, think of everybody else's feelings and reactions other than our own and be like very ingratiating, be very kind of, you know, make sure we're always presenting well and um, never getting, you know, angry or frustrated. And so we have to kind of be this perfect person and almost be vetted. Like you would, it feels like you don't have an intrinsic um, uh, just right, right to these, to this knowledge or relationship, but only if you're the right sort of person or you're, you know, you're good enough that, that, you know, maybe you'll be allowed to form a relationship. So yeah, it is kind of a bit, uh, I think, psychologically taxing and, um, you know, people um, sometimes have to take breaks or, you know, put it down, pick it up and, and just, um, yeah, different, different coping mechanisms, I think. Um, so I've got a question from Kel. Were you ready for the possibility that your donor wouldn't want an ongoing relationship with you? Yeah, and, and that was kind of what I was expecting, I suppose. Like I, um, I didn't, when, when the, the initial contact was like a, a, an outreach letter that I sort of had zero expectations. I thought that he wasn't even going to bother to reply to that letter. Um, so, so yeah, I, I think I'd kind of prepared myself for the for the worst. And I think um, I, I could have lived with that, you know, there'd be, I suppose, some form of resolution at least to, it, it would have been, I think, a painful rejection, but it would, you know, at least um, I think that would have been better than just never knowing one way or the other. Mm, yes. Um, and how has your father responded to your experience of meeting your donor family? How has that impacted him? Um, you know, we don't, like, <laughs> we, we don't really talk, like, it's something we don't really talk about, to be honest. Like, he, um, my parents separated when I was, was two. He was still involved in my life and my upbringing, but he did move into state when I was about 18. And, um, you know, we've, we kind of maintained like a sort of, um, you know, like a, a you know, a, a good relationship, but not a very close relationship. So, um, and part of that is, I think that just he's, he's just not someone that really talks about his, his feelings just in general, um, you know, sort of, Maybe, maybe a little bit generational, a little bit personality, yeah. but um, yeah, it's it's hard. So you're not because, really sure how he's yeah responded. to summarize. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, we, yeah, we don't we don't talk about it, so I don't really know. <laughs> yeah. I've got another question here from Jacinta. Um, she says, when talking to other donor conceived people, is the experience different when a person knows their where did where did I come from story involves a donor as opposed to people who discover it later on. Um, oh, like um, different donors and see people feel differently depending on yeah. early or late disclosure. Um, yeah, that, that's a really interesting question. I mean, I think that um, some, like, uh, I think uh, um, the trauma can definitely be lessened when it's it's not a late discovery. Um, but I, I think these questions about, you know, where do I come from, um, like that, that still, um, still quite um, normal no matter what age you find out so um, yeah I think it's it um, can definitely um, I think it less lessen trauma and improve um, positive family relationships when it, it's early disclosure and it kind of depends on the context like I know um, you know don't conceive people who are conceived outside the clinic system so it was like um, the donor was like a friend of the family it was a bit more informal and had always been available and you know, that seemed to create like um, sort of a positive outcome in terms of, um, you know, the way, the way she viewed her, her conception and, um, and family stories. So 
yeah, I think um, avoiding the secrecy and the lies is definitely a really good thing. Yeah, I guess it's that breakdown of trust, isn't it? You think if they haven't told me that, what else haven't they told me? Yeah, yeah, that's right. Mm. Um, and have you met any of your donor siblings? Um, I've met the three, my three donor siblings who are the children of my my donor from his um his marriage he's, he's now separated from his his wife but um yes so I haven't met any um other donor conceived siblings but I have met three um half siblings um from that so I guess more traditional I think the, relationship the you gave in your yeah. in your book was that uh you suspect that it's about 90 percent of donor conceived people don't know that they're donor conceived yeah yeah right? it's it's super high and um so when the law um, was changed in Victoria, it was actually a kind of two way so that the donors can um, also um, uh, reach out seeking information about their donor conceived children. So through through those statistics, we know that that, that most people um, that the donors try to contact, like they don't know they're donor conceived. So it seems like to bear out that sort of 90 percent mm. plus statistic. And so do you think, um, are you in favour of some sort of legal obligation to reveal? And I don't um, know how you'd enforce that, but yeah. I, I think that like perhaps it'd be best just to have, yeah, the information, like something like an integrated birth certificate where it's just, it's so obvious and in plain sight that, um, that there's kind of, um, that it, it just becomes a no-brainer to be open because the, um, because the, the information um, is, is out in the open anyway. Mm. And um, you mentioned, so you're a donor conceived person who was on the VATA committee and there's a donor recipient. Are there any actual donors on the VATA committee? Um, well, not that we know of, although not there's that you know a few from the medical fraternity. <laughs> um, but I, I think that there have been donors apply for those positions. So I would like, well, there was, there was um, I think there, there was one, um, but yeah, but um, I, I think that that also it's an important perspective um, to have that lived experience of donors because they're often, you know, they're the ones that are often the most shadowy and a lot of people love to speak on their behalf. You know, everyone will claim to know what they want, but um, <clears throat> yeah, I think that it's also important to have that kind of tri triangle or triad yes. represented. Um, and is there a charge to find out information? If you're applying for it to find out your donor's information, is there a charge oh, for that? Yes, there, there is. There is, um, which um, is a little bit, um, like it's not a huge amount of money, but some of the people that apply are students or young people, you know, 18, that, um, you know, it, it, it can be a barrier. But it's also, I think, just um, from a kind of, um, sort of uh, moral perspective to have to pay to find out this information and um I, yeah I, I would like to see that it would become a free service you know I've been on the board and I know kind of from a financial perspective it's quite minimal contribution to the running cost of the organization so um, I think there'd be some, a symbolic um win in, in kind of removing that charge and do you think there's any case for a um because we've had the uh, national apology for the stolen generations and we've had a national apology for adopted people and uh, adoption forced adoptions is there any scope for any kind of apology around because you were you were denied initially your records because you were born on the wrong side of the timeline mm -hmm. of the cutoff mm -hmm. is there any sort of do you think there's any need for an apology I do I, th I think that um that would be um a really good recognition and um, um, would like to advocate towards an apology kind of um, you know, working from the model of, of, of forced adoption. Um, and yeah, I, th I think there would be a lot of um, kind of healing and recognition, which I knew fl flowed from a lot of the people impacted by forced adoptions and similarly. And that there's also, um, you know, there's been um, quite kind of Scandalous, scandalous kind of ethical failings. That I think we really need some sort of inquiry, independent inquiry yes. into that as well, because um, you know, even just from other donor can see people that I know, there's been you know some some pretty shocking stuff that's been uncovered, um, 
and it's it, yeah I'm kind of surprised it hasn't really been like a mainstream news story but um but I think I think that an independent inquiry would be really kind of welcome to sort of um for like that I suppose clearing the air and that kind of truth and reconciliation kind of um uh model Mm. I know someone was asking earlier about whether there had been any instances of, um, you know, doctors using their own sperm uh, like they have been overseas. Um, yeah. Um, yeah. I, um, th that that has been the case, um, particularly for um, sort of the era before um, the um, frozen semen technology. So, um, you know, that doctors would sometimes kind of substitute them um, their own sperm, I guess, for convenience or whatever, um, but and and not imagining that there'd be things like consumer DNA testing that yeah. would ever come out. So that's I think this um, when you have a cloak of apparent absolute secrecy and anonymity, it can really kind of be um, allow you know unethical things to flourish, and um, you know would um, it it would would love to see that. Um, that, that you know at least be um like a fertility fraud kind of be, yes. um criminalized and um you know um not be legal up, uh, or you know not be legal or ethical i've got one another question from allison she said how did your donor's wife react when you got in touch um she said she found her donor and was excited he and her donor was excited to talk and to meet um, but then after that, he messaged to say that his wife had vetoed contact. Yeah, it's, it's that really something tricky to navigate for you as well. Um, it's it's a really common story and I hear it a lot. Um, in my particular case, my um, donor had separated from his wife by the time that I contacted him. So maybe that was fortuitous for my yes. situation. Yeah. Um, maybe not. Um, obviously. Um, and, and yeah, it's it's. I think that it uh, it sort of can trigger some kind of primal um, kind of reaction in some people, or almost like primal jealousy of like people like partners can be worried like you know we have children together and this other child's mm -hmm. popped up you know will they lay claims or um, you know somehow take away from um, my own children? But it's really not the case at all. Like it's a very um, you know misguided like people often don't understand the mo motivation. Say like no one has no donor conceived person um uh, spoken with hundreds has ever been um kind of motivated by that wanting to like inherit their money or or whatever i think that's name. a common question when you first yeah. make contact is what 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 is it that you want yeah yeah, yeah and but, actually it's just information that you want which is more precious than any gold or jewels or <laughs> exactly exactly yeah, yeah. It's, it's usually just to answer really basic questions um and yeah just to, to provide sort of um color in that picture of that sort of um, that sort of um, unknown um, half of, of, your, of your genetics and sort of and cultural heritage. Mm. Well, we've hit nearly 10 past eight. Has anybody else got any other questions? Because I don't want to keep Lauren here forever. Um, I, I'm just looking at the Q&A. Um, um, just maybe I could just whiz through some of those. Um, I think I've asked you most of them, but have a look, uh, see if I've missed anything. Okay. Someone said, if you had your choice, what age? Oh, no, oh, sorry, yes. you mentioned that one. Um, oh, um, yes, only took me 30 minutes to find a donor with a third cousin match. Oh, well done, Emily. That's, That's very amazing. impressive. <laughs> you must be a, a whiz. On, um, um, yeah, so, um, uh, yeah, it looks like you, yeah, so you have that um, phrase. So, so thank you, Susan. Good moderating. <laughs> well <laughs> done. At all. Yeah. Um, and so what have you learned finally? Just the final question. What have you learned from your journey? Never give up. Never give up. <laughs> yes, they're yeah. good words. Yes, it's yeah. a good message. Mm -hmm. And it has been, it was a really fascinating story to read. And thank you. It's been really wonderful talking to you. It's such a well-written book. And I would recommend everyone go out and get a copy and have a read. Um, of course, your local library, all good libraries will have a copy of this book, as will all good bookstores. Um, and if you are around the Monash area, um, Dimmicks in Eastland is, uh, I have to give them a big shout out because they were going to come and sell the books at tonight's event when we were doing it in person. Um, so yeah, do you go and have a talk to them. Well, thank you very much, Lauren. For coming.